the phone. Does this work? Can't tell actually. Well, Engineering, the last several of which have been with TriMet. She's also worked as a consultant. And she's going to fill us in on, on the I 205 project. Take it away. Great. Well, thanks for having me. All right, oh, waving wait. to the camera. Before we go live. I'm waiting for the light to turn on. Okay, I see a green light behind one of the. I'll, I'll go back there just to make sure. Okay, well, we'll get started though anyway. Yeah. Um, thank you for having me today. Um, as, um, as you said, my name is Megan Oldfield, and I'm a civil engineer. I'm licensed in the state of Oregon. Um, just a little bit about, a, a bit about my background, and I'll go into the, the talk about the I-205 light rail project. Um, I have a bachelor's in environmental engineering from Michigan Tech, and a master's in civil engineering with an emphasis in environmental engineering from University of Maine. Um, I've worked um, for four years as a design consultant, mainly doing um, wastewater and water-related activities. And then in 2001, I went to work for TriMet to work on the Interstate Max light rail project. I worked out on the construction site. Um, since about 2003, I've been working on the I-205 light rail extension, starting in conceptual design and then into preliminary final design, and now we're in construction, and the line's going to open in September of 2009. Um, so. What I'll do is mainly um, describe some of the major elements of the I-205 project, both from a design and construction standpoint. Um, TriMet, I'm not sure how familiar most of you are with TriMet. We have a pretty extensive light rail system. We've been building light rail since the late 1980s, starting with the, the blue line, the Banfield line, which goes from downtown Portland out to Gresham. We did an extension of the blue line in 1998 out to Hillsboro. We added the airport line, the red line, in 2001. We opened the yellow line, the interstate max line, in 2004. And now we're building what we're going to call the green line, the um, I-205 and Portland Mall extension. So there's a map up here that shows where the green line will go. It's got two different components to it. Um, the I-205 component, which is what I'm working on, is along the I-205 freeway from Gateway down to Clackamas Town Center. It's about six and a half miles. Um, of light rail extension. We also have, which you're probably more familiar with, the extension at the, the bus mall down here on 5th and 6th Avenue. So there are two sister projects that are part of one larger project called the South Corridor Project. Um, and we needed to add the lines in downtown Portland because of the additional cars we're going to be bringing on to the green line from I-205. We don't have the capacity downtown in the existing east-west stretch. I'm sure if you ride the line at all, you can tell that there's, there seems like, especially during rush hour, there's a car at every stop. Um, a light rail vehicle at every stop, and we just didn't have capacity. So we're adding additional capacity on the mall. And then when we do future extensions, for example, the line to Milwaukee is what we're going to be working on next. We'll be kicking off from this uh, new Portland Mall extension. So, um, so the, the service on the Green Line to Clackamas Town Center is the first time that we've served Clackamas County with light rail. TriMet, its full name is the Tri-County Metropolitan District of Oregon. So we're the transit agency that serves um, 
Clackamas, Multnomah, and Washington counties. And up until now, we haven't had any light rail service in Clackamas County, so they're pretty excited. We're pretty excited about that. Um, a few statistics about the line. We're going to be running the green line about 15 minutes every day, and we're estimating that travel times to get from Clackamas Town Center to Gateway is going to take about 15 minutes. To get from Gateway to Pioneer Courthouse Square, currently on the, on the blue line, is 23. So to get from Clackamas Town Center down to, to the Pioneer Courthouse Square is going to take about 39 minutes. And you will be able to get on the green line in Clackamas Town Center and travel down to, um, to Pioneer Courthouse Square and then to PSU without having to change trains. So that'll be pretty convenient. Just some ridership statistics. When we plan um, extensive uh, capital projects like this, we plan for 20 years out. So the light rail, this light rail line was designed for um, uh, ridership projections for the year 2025. The lines we're working on now, the, the extension to Milwaukee and the extension up into Vancouver and the Columbia River crossing, those are using 2030 numbers. But for 2025 numbers, we're estimating we're going to have um, over 46,000 people boarding a day um, on the green line, with 84% of those, of those riders starting their trips in the I-205 corridor. And we're estimating that we're going to be reducing vehicle miles traveled by 125,000 a day, which saves 350 billion approximately BTUs a year. So it's a pretty significant project from an environmental standpoint. These projects, as you can imagine, are pretty expensive. Um, and we rely in large part on our federal, our federal partners to help us with funding. So when we do large capital projects like this, the, we look to the federal government, the Federal Transit Administration, which is a division of the US DOT for our funding. Um, typically, currently they're funding about 60% of a project. So the, um, the green line in its entirety, which is the I-205 portion, the mall portion, other things like we have to buy light rail vehicles, we have to upgrade our maintenance facilities. Altogether, it's about a $575 million project. So 60% of that is coming from federal funding, and then 40% comes from local partners. And that would be um, TriMet, the City of Portland, ODOT, Clackamas County, Portland Development Commission, and Metro. And when I say partners, that is really a true a true thing. They, we bring all of our partners along with us through the design, through the construction. On the construction site right now, we have an ODOT inspector out there full time. Um, PDOT is, and Clackamas County are out there very frequently. They're reviewing our construction submittals. So we are really part of one big team. TriMet's the lead. We operate and maintain the system, but um, we look to our funding partners for their insight and for their information and really to, to build it as a region as part of the team because we are serving one region as a whole. So I'll get now into some of the details on the I-205 project. As I mentioned, it's a six and a half mile extension of our existing system. Um, double track, meaning there's a northbound and a southbound track. When we initially built the Banfield, we didn't have enough funding to build double track. So in some locations, we had just single track. So you'd have two lines going into one um, as a money saving feature. We also have some single track currently on the airport line because in a couple locations, we just, there's not enough space to put in double track. So for example, coming out of Gateway, there's a bridge that goes across the freeway and that's a single track bridge. Uh, but this is all going to be double track, um, open track or tie-in ballast, which is what you would see on a freight railroad. Um, the bridges are a little bit of an exception. We have a different kind of track construction called direct fixation. And I'll get into more of this in a little bit when we talk about track. We're adding eight stations along our six and a half miles. Um, the first one is at Main Street, and then the last one will be at Clackamas Town Center. And five of those stations are also serviced with a park and ride. So we have four park and rides that we're adding that are surface lots. And then we have one that we're adding that is a structured, um, a, a parking structure. So we're going to be adding approximately 2,300 parking spaces along the alignment. We are by and large going to be going either over or under all of the streets that we're crossing. So we're not going to have um, a lot of gated signalized crossings where the arms come down and the bells go off. Um, so we'll have one at one of our access points to a park and ride and also one on Flaydell Street, which is a pretty um, um, low-use roadway. And that's something that's strongly encouraged by a number of different groups by um, the state. ODOT Rail regulates all um, rail crossings. Um, they strongly encourage you to minimize grade crossings. Also, um, our operations and maintain, maintenance people prefer it, the community prefers it, just because anytime you can avoid an interaction between a train and 
car person, bicyclist, that's better. So to facilitate those grade separated crossings, we call them, we have quite a significant number of bridges on this project. We have seven different light rail bridges, plus a couple of other different kinds of structures that we'll talk about a little bit later as well. So the track, the stations and park and rides, and the bridges are the three most significant components of this project. And those are the ones I'm going to talk in a little bit more detail about. Um, of course, there's a lot of different elements that go into building a light rail line. And I'll touch on some of those also. But the bridges, the track, and the park and rides and stations are the major components. We have some buildings that we're constructing, or um, prefabricated metal buildings that are on site. We have seven substations, and those are used to bring power from the main power grid, from the power company, to um, um, converting it from AC to DC and then bringing it out to the line. So we have seven substations, um, seven signal and communications buildings, and, um, and one signal building. We are um, going to be connecting to a number of our existing bus lines, eight existing bus lines, then plus uh, Clackamas Town Center, where the southern terminus is, is a transit facility also. So we have a bunch of, I think, 10 different bus lines that go in there. So really trying to maximize our bus connections um, and mode of, um, mode of transport connections. And we're also building a new brake building for our bus drivers. So as I mentioned, the three main um, elements that we have are track and stations, park and rides, and, um, and structures. So I'll go a little bit into track first. So I mentioned before that we're, we're going to be building the open or tie and ballast track. Um, and like I said, that's what you'll see in a freight railroad. Other kinds of track that you'll have would be either embedded track or paved track. And that's what you see out here. In, um, on the mall. So the track is encased or encompassed in concrete or some other kind of roadway material. So it's a nice flush surface, blends in better, um, more aesthetically pleasing. And then on a bridge, you have direct fixation, which is what you can see on both of these slides here. So you'll have a bridge deck, and then you have plinths, concrete pads that the rail attaches to. And the different reasons for these are cost. Open track or time ballast track is much cheaper than um, embedded or paved track. But aesthetically, it's not as pleasing. So for an urban environment such as this, you can imagine having, having a ballast to track out in the middle of 5th and 6th Avenues just isn't going to work for a lot of reasons. That's not aesthetically pleasing. You can't drive on it, so you can't really have emergency access, that kind of thing. So when we built Interstate Max, we chose a variety of different types of trackway. Um, in areas where um, aesthetics were perhaps not quite as important and emergency vehicles didn't necessarily need to drive on the tracks, we used the open track. Um, but in areas along Interstate Avenue where we were trying to get some revitalization going, or the city's trying to get revitalization going, we were, uh, in a nod to that, we did paved track. The, the I-205 light rail project is along the freeway, so it's a different kind of corridor than the different kind of environment that you have down here, so we chose the open track. Um, so... The, the different steps that you take to building trackway. First of all, you put down a layer of, we well, need to make sure that your sub ballast or your subgrade um, is uh, sufficient to support your track. You don't have any soft spots, that kind of stuff. You may have to over excavate and put in some, some riprap or other rock to give yourself a nice stable base, same as you would do for a road base, very similar. Then you put down an initial level of ballast. Um, to date, we have placed for our six and a half miles, we're about two thirds done with our track construction right now, and we've placed 64 thousand tons of ballast to date. Um, then you place your ties. You see that machine there is getting some ties kind of spaced out. And we have those 30 inches on center. And total, we're going to have just under 25,000 concrete ties on this project. Um, and TriMet purchased a lot of the rail materials. We purchased the concrete ties, we purchased the rail, and then we gave it to the contractor rather than having the contractor buy it because we knew exactly what we wanted, what we needed. And when you have your contractor purchase something, of course, they put markup on it. So this way, we were able to save a few hundred thousand dollars in, in fees by not having them purchase the rail. We purchased it, which saved us those markup costs. Um, when we purchased the rail, we bought it in 80-foot sticks. And um, there's a lot of welding that has to happen to make six and a half miles then of consecutive rail. So what the contractor did is they set up a couple, in three different locations, they set up some um, uh, welding operations where they had a subcontractor come in that specializes in rail welding and they just 
for two or three weeks just did nothing but welding rails. So they would weld um, from 80 foot sticks to 800 foot sticks. So there's still some welds that have to happen out in the field on the site, but uh, most of them happened in a very um, short period of time and it kind of helps with quality control. You've got one guy just doing the same thing over and over and over again. So here you see um, someone grinding one of the rail welds. Um, obviously you need to make sure it's flush, you don't have any big divots or anything like that. Here we show um, taking these 800 foot sticks and stacking them up. Um, so after they had them put into the longer sticks, they stacked them until needed, uh, mainly in our park and rides. We have um, three of the four surface park and rides are pretty big, so there's a lot of space to put an 800 foot um, piece of rail. So they just take some equipment here and kind of pull it along. And you see on top of the rail, they have um, some um, uh, wheels, I guess. So you just kind of roll it along on top of those. You just have someone running ahead and you just you know, keep putting them up in front and just pull them along. It works pretty well. So here we are taking rail um, and placing it on the concrete ties. Um, so here on southbound track we don't have any ties. Here on northbound you can see them pulling the rail along. This is going to be at Division Street which is our second station to the north. The station will be here in between the trackway. And when you locate your stations, you can locate them either as on what we call center platforms, where you have your platform. So this graded area here is going to be the platform. You can have it either as a center platform, which is what we have here, or you can have it as a side platform, which would mean you'd have one on this side of the track and then one on that side of the track. So here, no matter whether you're going northbound or southbound, the platform's in the same spot. And you've seen these kinds of platforms around town. Um, we like to use the center platforms where we can for a couple reasons. First of all, you don't have to build as much stuff, so it's cheaper. And then second of all, if everybody, uh, at least on the I-205 project, the way that the, um, the, way the alignment worked out, um, there's no access from this side because it's the freeway. Everyone's accessing here from the west side of the trackway, which means you minimize the number of people crossing the tracks. Nobody ever walks across the northbound rail. Everybody walks across the southbound rail. So that means you have more controlled interface between the vehicles and the pedestrians, which helps increase uh, safety on the alignment. Now, when typically what we like to have for spacing between the northbound and southbound tracks, we measure everything between from uh, center line of track. So you take, it's, it's four and a half feet roughly from one rail to the other, so it's two and a half feet here. So you do all your measurements from center line of track. We like to have 14 feet from center line to center line of track, and that gives us enough space to put um, the, the power, the overhead catenary power line that runs the train, you can put the poles in between there. You also have enough space, clearance space for the maintenance guys to walk through so that they have a safe zone um, when they're walking the tracks during operating hours. And also just other infrastructure, you can see we have some vaults and stuff in between the tracks. So we like to have 14 foot track centers. Now when you put a platform in between the tracks, you don't have quite that much space. Um, the platforms need to be typically wider than that. So when we don't do center platforms is if we um, just don't have quite as much width. You're able to, to keep everything a little bit narrower if you use the side platforms. Anyway, that was kind of a tangent. But um, Other parts of the process is tamping the ballast, getting it nice and tight underneath the ties and underneath the trackway. Um, regulating the ballast, again, just um, getting every, uh, getting it to the right level and grade. The track also has to be lined and graded. So we're tying the green line into the blue line. And where we are doing this is just south of Gateway. We're not doing any work at Gateway proper, so just south of Gateway between Gleason and Burnside. Burnside, if you're familiar with the blue line, is where it takes a curve and a pretty uh, significant 90 degree curve and then starts down Burnside. So between those two points, we're tying in. So this is what the blue line looked like before we tied in. And then during a couple of different weekends, we shut down some trackway and tied in, cut old track out, put new track in. And so now you can see that we have the green line tied in there. So it, it, um, it peels off from the blue line. And there's a lot of coordination that had to happen for that. Because like I mentioned, we had to shut the trackway down. So we had to have bus bridges that went around that work site. So from 102nd to, to Gateway, we bus bridged around it, so that takes a lot of coordination. You know, there's cost and schedule impacts to, to the, um, the different parties. And we also had to do the same thing. We've done the same thing twice also to tie in the overhead catenary lines, which power the train. We still have one more to do to tie in the signal system. So it's a pretty 
complicated uh, time-intensive process. So those are some basics about track. Um, next, we'll talk a little bit about stations and park and rides. We, like I mentioned, we're adding eight stations. And when we decided where to add these stations, we looked at items such as um, how we can fa best facilitate different modes of transport. So we want to try to get people from buses to trains, trains to buses, however they need to get around in the easiest way possible. So we looked at where our existing bus lines were and where we could place stations to serve those buses, the number 9 Powell, the number 17 Holgate, um, the number 71 and 14 that go up Foster. Um, looking at connectivity, trying to figure out how to make the connection as, as short as possible so you don't have to walk great distances. Also looking at um, adjacent uses. Trim is not a developer. Our job is to move people around. We're a transportation agency, but we're very um, interested and sensitive to um, making adjacent uses something that help encourage people to ride transport. We want to get people out of their cars and onto the trains and onto the buses. So to the degree that we can help build our lines in a smart way to help facilitate transit-oriented development, we like to do so. So when we think about our station locations, one of the things that we did during preliminary engineering is we had a developer as part of the team and we said, look at these general areas where we want to put our stations. It, do you foresee development happening in any area where we should put a station in block A instead of block B because it's going to help facilitate development. It's going to be an easier transfer for people in the future. Um, so trying to think ahead like that. We look at basically um, for a couple different purposes, either quarter mile or half mile circles around our stations and we look and we see how much residential is, is located in the area, what is it zoned for. So trying to maximize the number of people that can get to a station easily. We assume people are going to walk quarter mile, maybe a half mile to get to a station. So if you have a big apartment complex and you want to serve it and you put the station just a half mile outside of that, you could be shooting yourself in the foot. If you could move it over a little bit so that people can more easily access the station, that's going to be um, helpful for encouraging ridership. So the modeling that was done in advance of this project showed that in rough numbers, about a third of the people are going to access these stations from the park and rides. About a third of the people will access from bus transfers, and about a third of the riders will come from either walk-ons or bike-ons. So it was looking at those three different modes of access to the station also that helped us figure out where the stations would be best located. We, um, we have a lot of common elements to our stations. They, have, they all have the same shelters. We're using the same shelters we used on Interstate Max. Um, same safety designs. Um, and there's a few reasons for doing that. We, it's cheaper if you have a lot of the same thing. It also helps create kind of a, a sense of, of place. People know that they're in a transit station. They know what to expect for safety. They know where they should be looking, what they should be, where they can be standing, um, all that kind of stuff. So have, having common elements helps give TriMet an identity. But that being said, we are very interested in being responsive to the community that we're traveling through because we are here to serve the community. So we like to have um, some unique features, mainly in the art program, that reflect the different um, qualities and characteristics of the different station locations. So we have eight stations, and at each station we have a different piece of art, um, different artist. There is one artist for two stations, but we, so we have seven different artists that worked on art for these stations. Before we um, before we selected the art, we had an art. We had a, a cultural historian do a history of the the I-205 alignment, looking historically at the different neighborhoods and user groups that have been located in those eight different station areas, and try to come up with some kind of a theme that could be mirrored in the art to create um, a sense of place and help define the area and make it a little bit special. So, for example, this statue here is a mock-up of a statue that you're going to see on the Main Street platform. And of the local artist, all of our artists are local from the Pacific Northwest. Um, and this is the wayfinding sculpture. And those, those concrete blocks that are in there are ginkgo leaves. And we also have ginkgo leaves in the park and ride landscaping. And the ginkgo leaf um, it has healing qualities attributed to it. And the Main Street Station and, and park and ride are very close to the Adventist Hospital. So part of that was kind of a nod to being in a healing location. Anyway. I'm not always good at art and interpreting it, but I do appreciate it once it's up. And um, Yeah, it was good. So one of the main concepts or features that we as a transit agency have on the forefront of our mind all the time, especially now in this day and age, is safety and security. That's the forefront of everything that we do. That's how we analyze 
every next step, every design, every construction aspect, to make sure we're doing it in the safest and most secure method possible. So some of the guiding principles that we use are called the SEPTED principles, which is crime prevention through environmental design. And taking these different um, concepts and applying them into your design helps make for, helps improve the safety and security of a design. So things like natural surveillance means don't build a wall of trees, a wall of bushes nobody can see in front of. When we have our uh, shelters on the, on the platforms and we have glass in them, we have art glass so it's kind of an etching, so again it helps improve the sense of place, but don't make it something that bad guys can hide behind. Thinking about natural access control, that means, for example, in our park and rides we have one way in, one way out, and we have CCTV on them so we can see facial recognition, license plate recognition, we know who's going in and out of the park and rides. Um, it's easier to find the bad guys that way too. They can't just scatter if there's only one way they can get in and out. Also this means things like using fences and some landscaping and other features to clearly define how people are supposed to move through a park and ride or through a station. It helps, um, it helps prevent giving the bad guys places to go. If everybody's going in the same direction, if somebody's over here, they're probably doing a bad thing. Territorial reinforcement, again, is kind of that sense of place I've been talking a about a little bit. When someone feels a little ownership um, of, um, of a place, they have a little more respect. We do find typically that our art doesn't get, I should knock on wood, doesn't really get vandalized terribly much, I think, because there is a degree of respect for that sense of place. Target hardening um, is just don't build stupid things. If you're going to build a cabinet, put a lock on it. Don't give somebody an obvious target, something obvious to, to hit for. So some of the, the ways that we've taken these concepts and brought them into our design is, like I mentioned, we have um, closed circuit TV or CCTVs in our park and rides and we'll be putting it on the stations so we'll be able to see who's going in and out of the park and rides, who's coming on and off the platforms, who's um, at the ticket vending machines. We also have taken, um, as part of a territorial reinforcement, reinforcement and natural access control, another thing that TriMet is trying to do um, system-wide where possible is to make the platforms fair only zones. So that means taking the ticket vending machines and taking them off the platform and moving them to locations in plazas or something adjacent. So for example if you've ridden on the band field at 42nd, 60th and 82nd you have to buy your ticket before you go down onto the platform. So that means if you're on the platform without a ticket you're a bad person doing a bad thing and you're going to get a fine for it. So we have used that concept on the I-205 line to take the ticket vending machines off the platform. We've also taken items like um, bike lockers and trash cans off the platform, or not even close to the platform, moving them as far away as is reasonably possible, and that is a bomb deterrent. So you can't put bombs in things, so that's kind of a... And also then you have fewer places to hide on the platform, but we decided where we do place them that it's not in a corner behind a dark, you know, in a dark alley, dark scary thing. Um, use of lighting is very important. We found on Interstate Max that the stations that we have, the light levels are bright. Not so bright that you can't stand there for 10 minutes and wait for your train, but you're not going to want to loiter all day because it's pretty bright and we find that the crime statistics on Interstate Max um, are really pretty low and we think that lighting is one of those main, is one of the good reasons and so we're duplicating those lighting features um, on the I-205 alignment. We, um, I mentioned the shelters are pretty open, yeah vegetation again making sure that you don't plant trees in the way of the CCTV cameras, you know, making sure that all the elements work together so you're not just taking a picture of a tree. Um, and then our park and rides use a lot of those same um, SEPTED principles. Um, as I mentioned, the ingress, egress, the vegetation. So these are a couple of pictures of our Main Street park and ride. Um, so uh, one looking northbound, one looking southbound. This, I think, is probably the same plaza. I know, maybe it's not. We have two of these, one at each entrance to the platform. Um, but anyway, so like I mentioned, we have four surface park and ride lots and one structured lot. And so how did we decide where to place them? This project is located in State Freeway right of way. And you may have noticed that there was a lot of open space there. So we took advantage of that open space and parked cars there. So we have, in the ODOT right of way, we have one lot that's 425 spaces, one that's 410 spaces, one that's 125 spaces. Um, so that was a very good, cheap use of land that wasn't going to be used for anything else. Anyway, it saves ODOT from having to mow it then also, so they like that. Uh, two other park and rides that we had um, were on private property, um, and those were spaced in conjunction with the local jurisdictions, kind of talking about how they see their development happening and where do we best place these park and rides to help facilitate 
growth and future zoning changes and that kind of stuff in the future. We need to look um, at emergency access. That's one of our uh, components. And when we design the park and ride, we need to look at every jurisdiction seems to have different rules as far as what stall aisles and width, or I'm sorry, stall sizes and aisle widths and all that kind of stuff is. Um, so depending on what the criteria is, sometimes it's more efficient to have angled parking, sometimes it's more efficient to have straight-in parking. And you also have to look at what the different jurisdictions require as far as emergency access for fire, especially to make sure that you have enough room for turnaround. You have to look at where your closest fire hydrants are. You may have to bring water into the park and ride, that kind of thing. Let's see. Um, structure versus surface parking lot. Um, as you can imagine, a surface lot is much, much cheaper than building a structured park and ride. When we did the initial planning for this project, we had three um, of the, the parking lots were structured, but that was one of the first things that was modified when we were doing some initial budgeting for the project because it was just much, um, much cheaper to do surface lot. But we do, um, in the event that these park and ride lots fill up 20, 30 years, 10 years, whatever, we would still have the ability to transfer the, or turn them into um, structured parking in the future if we would need to, to, to get some extra spaces. Uh, just a couple of pictures of um, the, um, the station and the park and ride under construction. Um, when we looked at the Main Street station, so this is the station that's furthest to the north, we talked quite a bit with the Portland Development Commission in the preliminary planning stages about where this station should go. I don't know if you can kind of see, but up in the corner there, there's a little bit of asphalt roadway. So we are next to, and you can see a little in that photo also, so we're next to 96th Avenue, so 96th and Main, which is near where Adventist is. Initially, we thought, well, let's take the, the tracks and let's place them way up against the freeway because then that way nobody has to cross the tracks at all. You don't have to drive across them, walk across them to a great extent. Um, we thought that would help um, just kind of with the safety aspect. But then uh, Portland Development Commission said, well, but, you know, if you look across the street, there's a lot of redevelopment potential. And it's going to really um, invigorate and vitalize the area to have the station right there, to have all that activity right on the street rather than having it pushed way against the freeway. Plus, what kind of environment, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a more pleasant environment here next to the street than it is next to the freeway. We do have some stations that are right next to the freeway. And so we said, you know, you're right. This is really as a greater good. It's a little cheaper to put it over here, but really as a whole, it's better to have it here next to Main Street and 96. So we made that choice in conjunction with our partners. Um, again, here's some other pictures of uh, the Main Street Park and Ride. I'm showing you the Main Street Mar Park and Ride because it was the most... Um, complete. And down here, this is um, an artist's rendition of what the Main Street Station will look like. Here you see this wayfinding sculpture that we looked at or talked about a little bit earlier. More pictures of the Main Street. This is um, an artist's rendition of the Lentstown Center Foster Road Station. And um, this is an elevated station. We have um, three of our stations are at grade, meaning they're at uh, adjacent street level and the remainder are either above or below. So this was one of our major design struggles was how do we best um, get over that roughly 20 foot uh, vertical distance between the roadway and the station. Because um, you have to be ADA compliant of course. Are elevators the right thing to do? We decided not really because it's only 20 feet. It's a lot of money to spend. Um, but how do you make this the um, the shortest, most comfortable, convenient walking distance possible. So we put a lot of time and energy into thinking about how this was going to work. You see here we have some, again, unique art. Um, there was a lot of discussion also about this station. The Lentz community is very interested in redeveloping and revitalizing itself. And we wanted to make this a backdrop that was suitable to help support some of that development. We talked about putting a park and ride here for quite a while, but there was really nowhere Again, we couldn't afford a, a structured lot. And for surface lots, there was really no big, good open space like we had on some of the other locations. We would have had to take businesses, which we didn't really want to do. And also, it didn't really help the revitalization. It's hard to revitalize an area if the center was a big parking lot. So this one doesn't have a park and ride. So that's some of the logic behind what we did there. The, the southern um, station is the Clackamas Town Center, uh, Transit Center. So we. Again, Connect Max with 10 different bus lines. We have this because this, this is a transit center. We have a four story parking garage, which you see off to the side there. Um, the bottom floor is going to be the bus layover area, and then the next three floors will be for parking, and it'll be shared also with the mall because the Clackamas Town Center Mall is right there. 
Here's some photos of the garage under construction. I'm going to try to not run out of time here, so I'm going to um, step then on to bridges. Um, as I mentioned, we have seven, uh, seven bridges total. Um, six of them have the same um, pre-stressed girder construction. One has some steel girders, and we'll look at that in a second and kind of talk about how that is. This is the Johnson Creek Boulevard Bridge. It's our longest bridge, about a quarter mile long. Um, here you see some pile driving for the bridge at Powell. Um, the bridges all have abutments on pile and the columns that we have would be um, on um, drilled shafts. We have about 200 pile total that we drove for the job for the different bridges and structures. Um, so, you, so you drive the pile, you build your pile cap, you do your columns, and then a cap there. Place your girders, do a deck pour, um, and then on top of that, you place your rail. So you just kind of you know, you know, start at the bottom and move up to the top. And um, this, this bridge here has three different spans, the largest, largest span that crosses Powell and then two little jump spans. And it looks a little funny and you say, boy, how come you have so much space between um, Powell and, and the bridge columns? Couldn't you have narrowed that in a little bit? One of the, the design um, constraints that we had on this project is since we're in ODOT right-of-way, we need to respect their space and what their needs are going to be for the future. And so ODOT has um, conceptual plans for expanding the freeway, adding a fourth lane. So they had a line on a map we had to stay outside of. So in a few locations, it looks like, boy, you sure could have put the train closer to the freeway. But we can't because ODOT needs to preserve that space for themselves in the future. So um, that influenced the design here, as well as the design at the Johnson Creek Boulevard Bridge. It's a quarter of a mile long. It's our longest bridge. And that's not only to get over the off-ramp and the roadway that's there, but they have a, a lot of plans for future um, cloverleaf type intersections, so we had to stay outside of those lines as well. Here we have the um, abutment at Herald. And again, we used similar construction for these different bridges, and that helps with um, design and construction efficiencies. When we um, did preliminary design, we had a design consultant look at what the best bridge types would be. And we had a couple different types of bridges. We had the pre-stress girders, but we also had the post-tension box girder. And then when the contractor came along, we, it's a design-build contract, so they have a lot of flexibility to make modifications in the design for efficiency's sake. And they said, you know what? It's much better for us um, and for the project to just do one type of bridge. So that's basically what we have. There's a few differences. So here the girders are set at the Herald Bridge. One of the main design criteria for the bridges is we have to make sure we have enough vertical clearance. So working with our jurisdictional partners at, at the city, PDOT, at ODOT, and Clackamas County, we had to work with what their clearances are to make sure that we had our bridges tall enough. So, um, yeah, so that's that. This bridge goes over the Springwater Corridor Trail. It's a pretty short bridge. It's only about 70 feet tall, or 70 feet long. And initially, in conceptual design, we didn't have a bridge here at all. We just had the train crossing the, the path at grade. But working with... Uh, the community, the different bike and pedestrian groups, and with the city parks department, we decided that really, for safety and security purposes, we needed to spend the money to put in a bridge because this is just the safer way to do it. We don't have all those interactions with kids and cyclists and all that kind of stuff. It's better to spend the money and just do it this way. Now, the city parks department said, boy, but I'm a little concerned about having such a, you know, a, dark, a dark spot in the path, especially because you're going to go into the freeway bridges right after that. It's going to be kind of dark, scary. So what we did is, in the middle of the bridge, rather than having it be full concrete, we have uh, some um, steel grating, so it now allows some natural light to come down to the path beneath. So it's, and there's also lights underneath it. So trying to um, serve the, the needs of the alignment, but also be sensitive to the communities that we're going through and those around us to try to modify the design to serve all users as best as we can. Um, the, the bridge across Johnson Creek is our most unique structure. This, again, is pretty short. It's about 100 feet long. And you'll notice that we have steel girders here up on top of the bridge. So rather than the bridge deck being on, on top of the girders, here we have the bridge deck, and it's supported by the girders more in a vertical sense. And this, even though it's a short span, was probably one of our most challenging locations on the project. As you can see, directly after the bridge, you cross the street, cross Flavel Street. This is our other at-grade crossing. So we had grades we had to meet um, on the top of the bridge. We couldn't raise the roadway up too much either because directly to the east of this picture that you see here, we go underneath the freeway, and we needed to have 
18 feet from the bottom of the freeway bridge to the road. And existing was only 19 and a half. So we could only bring the road up a foot and a half. So we have constraints over the top of the bridge. And then on the bottom of the bridge, uh, Johnson Creek floods a lot, 100-year um, floodplain. So we also had to have the bottom of the bridge pretty high. So if we wanted to use our typical um, precast girder, it would have been far too deep. We wouldn't have met either criteria. So we had to do kind of a unique, a unique structure here. Um, Additionally, there was a lot of there's been a lot of um, a lot of attention on the structure because um, Johnson Creek supports endangered species. There's um, salmon and steelhead that have been um, historically in this creek, so we had to work with NOAA Fisheries to do a design and construction best management practices to minimize or eliminate any impacts to the creek. So we spent a lot of time in this one area. I mean, you look at it, it's a concrete line. Creek, there's a lot of shopping carts and it's hard to believe you need to spend so much time there. But I mean, it's the right thing to do, so it's what we did. Here we see some columns for the Johnson Creek Boulevard Bridge. These trailers and trucks in the background is where our construction field offices were co-located with the contractor, which has been very helpful because if we have an issue, they have an issue. We're all right there at the same time. It helps generate a real good team environment because at the end of the day, I mean, we're on different sides of the table, but at the end of the day, we're all part of the same team. We all want the same thing, a good, healthy, successful project. And so it helps to be co-located. Here you see them setting the girders um, for one of the spans of the Johnson Creek Boulevard. Uh, these were um, all precast. They came from Knife River, which is a company down in Eugene. And all total, we had 145 girders on our different um, bridges and structures, which is really quite a bit. It's one of the bigger jobs that Knife River has done. So these would come up on a truck from Eugene. It's pretty fun to watch. And again, here we have the, um, the girder set before the deck is placed. Uh, this is the top of that same bridge, and again, you see the direct fixation track there. Um, we have um, all total for our bridges, we poured about 8,000 cubic yards of concrete <coughs> for the bridges. So, a different kind of structure now, going away from the bridges where the train's on top. Here, we needed to go underneath Stark and Washington Streets which are um, just south of um, the I-84 interchange. And um, so where that, that semi is driving is um, Washington or Stark. Then there's another street here just in the foreground of the picture. And this used to be all at grade. So the grade used to be up where the truck is. So we had to excavate down and build these bridges. So basically close the roads half at a time and put down some girders, repave, drive a lot of piles in here to create um, structures for the vehicles to go on top of and the trains to go underneath. It was a pretty big undertaking. A hundred of the piles we drove were for this structure. So you can see a bunch of the piles here. So what we did is we, we drove the piles, we inserted some timber lagging, backfilled it with pea gravel, and then you see here the um, Rainier, the steel working sub, is forming up some rebar so we can pour walls in front of those. And the walls will be the edge of the trackway. And then here we are pouring some walls in the location between um, Stark and Washington. Um, and then an additional structure, one of the features that um, we have on this project, since we're in ODOT right away, we're right next to the ODOT multi-use path. And there were a number of um, times when we had to shift the path over slightly because the path alignment was in conflict with the train alignment. So, um, one area where we didn't have enough room to just scoot it over was here at Monterey. Monterey is the street just north of Clackamas Town Center. And there wasn't enough room between the edge of the existing Monterey structure you can see up there in the corner and where ODOT's future expansion is going to be. Um, so we only had enough room to put the train underneath Monterey. We didn't have enough room for both the train and the multi-use path. So we had to try to get creative. We said, well, can we take the path down and around Monterey? And the answer was no, because it was a huge out of direction move. Um, and would have been a pain. Nobody would have liked it. We said, well, can we go over Monterey? Could have, but we would have had to chase, since it has to be ADA compliant, 5% slope, would have taken us forever to chase that grade, hugely expensive. So we said, well, um, what if we just pop a hole through, these, through the existing abutment, through the MSC walls, and just build a box structure in the middle of the MSC wall? And that turned out to be the best option. So that's what we've done here. So this used to be MSC wall all the way through, and we've put, placed a box there for the multi-use path. And you can see here on top, we're redoing Monterey Street. So 
So those are highlights for the three major elements. Um, and I probably have just about five minutes left. I think that's going to work on time okay, yeah? yeah. Um, so those are some of the significant project um, elements, but that's not all it takes to build a light rail line. One of the things I like best about my job is any day I could walk in and have to deal with each and every one of these items. And it's very exciting because it's very diverse, it's very challenging for your mind, um, and it's fun to know a little bit about all these different items. As I mentioned in my intro, my, um, my background, my education is in environmental engineering, and so mainly water and wastewater. So I didn't take transportation and structural classes and any of that kind of stuff. So it's, um, I think that working on projects like this that are very diverse are an excellent opportunity to really expand your horizons and, and to be a more well-rounded, um, broad engineer. So um, some of the items that I have here, lighting, we have to add more lighting for our stations and our park and rides, but also there was a lot of lighting that ODOT had, lighting the freeway, that was going to be in conflict either with our light rail line or with our park and ride. So we had to do a lot of relocation of um, ODOT lighting. Also some city and uh, county lighting had to be relocated. Fencing, we're going to spend probably um, over a million dollars in fencing. Fencing off the alignment because you want to make sure that people can't get onto the train. The ODOT bike path I just talked about is going to be right next to the train. You need to have fence in between the two of those so you don't have people getting into the trackway, and um, uh, that's a, a safety feature. Additionally, the fence needs to be, if it's within a certain distance of the, the trackway, it needs to be grounded. Because if, heaven forbid, something would happen to the, the overhead lines, they break, they flop over. If they hit the fence, the fence then electrified, so it has to be grounded. So we're going to be spending, so probably all told, over $2 million of fence and grounding. So it's a pretty big component of the project. So you need to make sure that you're doing it smartly, that you're trying to figure out, you wouldn't think fencing is that hard but you need to really think about who am I trying to keep in and out, what's the right smart way to do it. When you're paying for it by the foot, you really try to think about that stuff a lot closer. Uh, landscaping is important for a lot of different reasons. First of all, it's typically a permit requirement. So we had to get permits from the Bureau of Development Services in the city of Portland and from Clackamas County for all of our park and rides, and one of those components is landscaping. So we have to have the um, appropriate perimeter landscaping, internal landscaping. Um, we have had to remove some trees, so we're replacing all those trees plus more. So overall, we're adding um, 1,500 trees and over 20,000 shrubs and ground covers along the line. I mean, it's going to be green and pretty. You probably noticed in a lot of those pictures of the Main Street Park and Ride, there's a lot of greenery out there. It looks beautiful. Or if you drive up the freeway now and you look at the Main Street Park and Ride, it looks great. It's awesome. Um, then some of the other elements, retaining walls. Retaining walls have been huge on this project. We have over um, about 400,000 square feet of retaining walls. It's pretty huge. Um, and we use basically three different types of retaining walls. We use cast in place walls, um, which is where you put the, the rebar in and form up around it and then pour the wall. So you do the footing first and then you, then you pour the wall. We also do, um, we've done mechanic mechanically stabilized earth or MSC walls. And when I showed you the Monterey undercrossing was mentioning the MSC walls, that's what those look like. So basically you build those in lifts. So you have a panel that has a strap on it and you, you lay that down, then you put earth on it to kind of secure it, then you put the next level on and you just kind of build it step by step. So it's panel, strap, earth, panel, strap, earth, and you just build it up higher and higher and higher. Um, then also we've been using ultra block walls, which are basically just a big blob of concrete, typically a recycled concrete, and you build it um, kind of like um, Legos and Lincoln Logs. Um, uh, with the base wide and then kind of narrowing up to the top. So we use basically those three <coughs> kinds of walls, and we used about 11,000 cubic yards of concrete for our walls. It's been a huge piece of the job. Um, we started building retaining walls probably last March, and we're going to finish up in about a month or two. That's a lot of walls. Yes. Um, utilities. Yes, utility relocations are also incredibly important. We have private utilities and public utilities that we need to work with. Private utilities typically are in public right-of-way through franchise agreements. So that would be gas and power, um, phone, TV. So typically what happens there is with the franchise agreement, they're there using public right-of-way for free, and then when the public jurisdiction tells them they have to move because of a capital project, they have to move at their own cost. So that means that we coordinate with the gas company and the power company and the phone company and, and tell them, this is where our project is, here's where you can safely move and not be in our way, and then it's on their dime. That's just the way that that works. So that's worked pretty well for us. Um, for public utilities, there's water lines, sanitary lines, storm lines. We have had to relocate, since we're right next to ODOT's freeway, they have a lot of drainage, a lot of drainage pipes. We've had to relocate over 30,000 feet of storm pipe, anywhere between 8-inch and 72-inch pipe. 
Um, so it's pretty diverse. It's um, quite a range of activities there. We've had some sanitary that we had to relocate. We had to relocate some of ODOT's fiber optic line, which runs their cameras and also their ramp meters. What you see here is the city of Portland has five lines, um, large water lines between 48 and 60 inches that run underneath the freeway that feed the city's water from Bull Run, the water supply from Bull Run. And um, we needed to protect, and so the train's going to be running on top of these. So we needed to make sure that these things were cathodically protected, meaning if it's a steel pipe or iron pipe and we've got power that's running to feed our service, when you have power that jumps off our grid and gets down onto the pipe, it can erode the pipe. Not good. So you need to do some kind of protection of the pipe so you have sacrificial anodes or cathodic protection of some kind. So when, when something does jump to the pipe, it instead jumps onto this line over here and goes into a deep well into the ground, which is what we've basically chosen to do. We also have put, just to support the pipe, we also put um, some saddles and boxes across these pipes. So that was a pretty big endeavor. We did that last spring. And the pipes weren't flushed um, and empty. So they were still under pressure. So that was a pretty um, gentle operation. Because you can imagine what it would be like to blow one of these things open. Basically washing out the freeway, getting me on the news, which I'm not interested in doing. Um, there's also a lot of civil work and road work that we had to do in conjunction with this project. We have had about 220,000 cubic yards of mass excavation on the job. When you do the preliminary um, planning for a project, one of the things you need to do is an environmental impact statement. That's a federal requirement, a NEPA requirement. And what they do is they look at traffic impacts, noise impacts, other environmental impacts, and you have to figure out how to mitigate them so that you don't leave the place any worse off than you found it. So, especially for our park and rides, they look at the different traffic we're going to generate and say, can the local grid handle all the traffic you're going to be putting in here? And by and large, the answer was yes, but sometimes we had to do things like add extra right turn lanes at signalized intersections, and we had to add a couple of signals. So what you see here is on 92nd Avenue near Powell, we had to extend a right turn lane. So there's some civil work that had to happen here. So we had to redo some curbs, add some drainage, um, redo a sidewalk. So there's a little bit of that kind of work that has to happen in conjunction with the project. Another environmental impact is noise. We, um, with our federal dollars, we're not able to mitigate existing noise, so we're next to the freeway, and that's loud, and we can't spend federal money, our federal money, to fix that problem, but noise that the train creates, we have to mitigate. So we're adding over a mile of sound wall along the alignment um, to help protect the uh, adjacent residences from noise generated from our train. And what we decided to do, um, since TriMet um, tries to be an environmental leader, trying to do things as green as we can. We found a product called carcinite. So rather than, um, which is, um, you see up here in the upper hand corner, so it's a bunch of different panels that's a, a composite that's filled with chipped up tires. So rather than building concrete sound walls, we took these panels, saving about 9,000 tires from going into the landfill, and we used uh, those to build our sound walls, which is a pretty cool thing. Um, another feature of, significant feature of a light rail line is what we call systems. It has three different components. The, the power to run the train, um, which is composed of the substations, which take, like I said, the power from the main grid and bring it out onto the line. And then the over cat, overhead catenary system, which is the poles and the wires that you see. Um, we also have the signal system and the communication system so that operators can talk to central control, um, operate switches so we don't have trains running into each other, that kind of thing. It's, it's really a pretty big piece of the work. We've put in 70 miles of conduit to help facilitate these three different functions. Uh, we have 377 um, overhead catenary poles. It's a pretty significant piece of the work. takes a lot of coordination. It, of course, is what comes in near the end. So the, a lot of the work that you're going to be seeing in the next few months on this line is going to be systems related. Track has to be there before you can put up the stuff that, support, that it supports. Uh, the unforeseen conditions, yes. And if you have been out driving down I-205 in the last three or four months, you've seen people clamoring over rock. We've, we're going to spend over $600,000 getting rid of a big piece of rock. Um, looked at, should we blast it? Um, could have blasted it, but in order to do blasting, you have to do a pre-blast survey. And we're right next to an apartment complex that has hundreds of apartments. So we'd have had to go into each and every apartment, video it, see what it looked like, talk to the nice people. Uh, awful. Would have taken forever. So, um, and we're right next to the freeway. We would have had to do a rolling slowdown from I-84 down past Sunnyside. Also, a lot of planning, very expensive. So we chose a method that's more expensive than blasting, but overall is going to be a little bit cheaper. So you see these guys up here on the on the rock, what they're doing is they're drilling holes and then they put an expanse of grout in there. So it's a, you can breathe the dust, you could, I mean, I wouldn't eat it, but you know, it's, it's not a harmful chemical. And it just, as it expands, it kind of cracks and fractures the rock enough so you can bring a big piece of equipment in and start pulling it out. Um, yeah, not fun, but 
I mean, you never know what's underground, right? As I mentioned, we're in ODOT right-of-way. When the freeway was built, it was built in two different segments. Um, one was before all the environmental legislation called NEPA was in, in, invoked, and that was that's from Foster South. From Foster North, um, the freeway was built post NEPA, and it was built with a graded transitway in it. So we had, it had always intended to have a lot of extra space to accommodate transit, which is where a lot of the room for those parking rights came from. So the north half of our project already had sound berms in it, had basically a graded trackway. It was really pretty simple construction. The southern half is where we had to run into property acquisition, started building retaining walls, had to do some of those sound walls. Um, so being able to use ODOT right-of-way was definitely um, helpful for the project. It really minimized the number of displacements that we had. TriMet doesn't like to displace people. We do have eminent domain. We can if we have to, but we really don't like to. So we, considering we had six and a half miles, um, the number of acquisitions we had was really pretty minimal. And again, we're next to the bike path. Um, one of the great features of having that graded transit way is in the project we have to go from the east side to the west side of the freeway. And there was already a structure that was there to, to um, allow or facilitate that. Originally designed for buses, the train fits, so we didn't have to build a tunnel to go underneath the freeway. This was fabulous. Such good forethought. It's awesome. Again, TriMet um, prides itself in being an environmental leader. So we tried to come up with, every time we do a project, we try to come up with something new and green to do. For example, those Carsonite sound walls. Um, another way that we reuse tires is in the wheel bumper stops in park and rides. We, um, those are recycled um, tires also. And that 2200 number isn't quite right. I just learned today it's more like 2500 to 3500 tires are going to be saving from a landfill with the wheel stops that we're using. Um, <clears throat> We've had to relocate some ODOT sound walls because they were in the way of our train. But rather than just throwing them out, we can pick the panels up, set them aside, and then place them back in again, which is the smarter way to do it. Using porous paving whenever we have um, parking for our maintenance facilities. We looked at using porous paving in our parking rides, but um, the research that we did showed that, especially in an area like this where a lot of people use studded tires, if you have somewhere where there's a lot of slow traffic that's doing a lot of turning movements, it really pits out. The, the parking lots and the asphalt, and it just creates a maintenance headache. And it really doesn't give you the kind of service that you're looking for. So we decided not to do that. One of the homes we did acquire we're using is our field office trailer. So we have a full kitchen as a field office trailer. It's kind of nice. The contractor's using a 5% biodiesel mix in their construction vehicles. Oh, and so the, the stormwater that we have to treat from our parking rides and our bridges, we're not putting it into the storm sewer system. We're putting it through, we're treating it through bioswales. And just a couple last slides here. So the project that I'm working on um, has three different main contracts for it. We have the main light rail contract, which is the one that I'm in charge of managing, which is about $165 million. Um, then we also have a design build contract for the parking garages, which is about $15 million. And then the landscape contract we did as a typical, a traditional design bid build, and that's about $2.5 million. So we have about $182 million worth of, um, worth of work that we're managing in our field office. As I mentioned before, there's a lot of other supporting contracts that we have as well. And... We're going to open in September 2009. We'll see you then. Sorry that ran a little long. Okay. Thank you, Megan. Uh, we have time for some questions. Um, the audience. Before somebody asks a question, where's the uh, signage? Yes. When we do the, um, that's a good question, when we do the initial planning stages and the EIS stages, we partner a lot with Metro. Metro does all of the environmental planning for us and the modeling, and then we take over once we go into design. So all of those numbers were generated by Metro. And so it was through different modeling activities. And I'm going to be out of my skis if I say much more on that. Yeah. Yes. Uh, the Milwaukee line. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. And um, I was just wondering um, how much you plan for that in the Clackamas Tunnel Center. The two lines won't be connecting. They're going to go to two different terminal points. Um, so we do lessons learned after each line. So we'll be incorporating those into the Milwaukee line. But as far as the, the design of the I-205 line and the Milwaukee line, the, there's really not much connectivity. Now, the bus mall portion of the, the project that I'm working on, it's kind of two sister projects in one. 
that is definitely being designed with Milwaukee in mind because Milwaukee's going to take off from the PSU section of the, the mall. Yeah? Uh, you mentioned in the crime prevention component mm -hmm. that uh, CCTV is mm -hmm. type recognition. Are you doing any kind of logging of that to see who's coming and going? Or no, no, but we just have it, you know, you know, we just keep the video so we have it as needed, but we don't. No. Mm -mm. Yes? So, how many additional cars is the Green Line going to uh, bring online? We are purchasing, I believe it's 21 vehicles with the option for three or four more. They're about three and a half million dollars a piece. So, pretty spendy. <laughs> yeah. Yes? Mm -hmm. The elevator? Uh, we only have one elevator on the project, and that's at the Clackamas Town Center garage. The other elevated stations, uh, we decided not to use elevators um, because um, they, they don't, if you're only going to go up one level, the benefit that you get from having an elevator doesn't really cost out. And when, when we talk with, we have a, a Citizens for Accessible Transit committee that we meet with very regularly. A lot of people in that community aren't really big fans of elevators because a lot of times bad people do bad things in elevators. Um, and so we try to be cognizant of that. Additionally, we don't want to create a situation um, like where if the elevator's broken, then you're trapped. You have nowhere to go. So we need to do a ramp anyway just to give people a way to get on and off the platform. And if we're going to be putting in the, the effort into a ramp, do we really need an elevator? And we decided no. Yes? Vacant, you know, they can be, I mean, kind of create dead zones, you know, just kind of. Uh, in the parking garage, yes, we do have some retail space in the front, the first floor of the parking garage, um, in front of where the buses are. The parking lots that are on ODOT right of way, there, we have three parking lots on ODOT right of way, and ODOT precludes any kind of commercial venture. So even if we wanted to, we couldn't put a coffee shack up. Can't, can't, won't. Now, the fourth park and ride is a surface park and ride lot um, on what was private property that we purchased in Clackamas County. And the deal there is that we have with the county is if and when the day comes that that thing is chock full, we will partner with the county to make a mixed use, um, to, to facilitate or help support a mixed use parking structure. So yes, we would again um, have some kind of retail on the ground floor. Yeah, good question. Yes? Um, you talked about partners. Mm -hmm. Good question. And we do have a lot of history working with ODOT and with PDOT, the city of Portland, since we have so many of our lines going through their jurisdictions. This was, like I mentioned, the first time we worked with Clackamas County on a light rail project. And we didn't really know each other. Um, but we've really developed, I think, a lot of good trust and understanding and have an excellent working relationship that we're going to be bringing forward into the Milwaukee line. That's a good question. There are a number of different jurisdictions also that we partnered with that weren't necessarily funding partners, um, but like the Clackamas River Water District supplies the water in the, in the county, and we needed to relocate some of their lines. So we do always find new partners that we need to bring online. And um, just needing to recognize that we're all advocating for our, for our, um, our facilities and our needs, and that we all do want to be part of the same team and have the same goals in mind, and just treating people with respect and dignity, all that kind of stuff. And yeah, you don't always see eye to eye. You have to sometimes agree to disagree. Move on. Yeah. Yes? Uh, who's building the rail cars? Uh, Siemens. We, um, since we have federal money, we have to comply with what's called the Buy America Clause. So in a general sense, everything we buy has to be made in the US. So we can't get anything from overseas. Unless that's the only place it's made, we can get a special exception, which we have in some locations. For example, at the end of the track, we have bumping posts so the train doesn't run off the end of the track. And the kind of bumping posts that we need are only made in Germany. So we got an exception to buy those in Germany. Right? But by and large, everything has to be made in the US. So if something shows up on site, and this has happened on my job a few times, a piece of conduit shows up, a light pole shows up, and it's stamped made in Canada, get it out. Try again. Send it home. That's the rule. Yep. This might be more of a general question for yep. you, but for the Green Line, did you take any special precautions in the event of an ice storm? We have. So what we're going to be doing is adding what we call ice cap to um, the top of the catenary line. So it's just basically a little hat over the catenary lines to kind of help 
um, maintain the line so that we don't get an ice buildup. And also, we've, as an agency, kind of changed how we function, um, keeping trains running, because if you keep the trains running, you can keep the ice from building up on the line. Yeah, that was definitely one of our lessons learned. Mm -hmm. Yes? Please. When you're dealing with 800 foot long sticks of rail and then you're welding them together creating extremely long sticks of rail, how do you deal with expansion, temperature expansion contraction? Good question, and you do see that. Um, we, um, and we've had a few issues with that on this project, in fact. When we, you know, when we, when we do the direct fixation, uh, so we have the, the rail on the concrete plinths, we, um, we did a couple of, we, we placed the rail first in the right spot, not temporarily fixing it down, but put it in the right spot and we built the plinths around it. And we did some concrete pours. Since it was going to be pretty hot one day, we did a couple of concrete pours that started at 3 in the morning. And then as, so the, as it was setting and as the temperature rose, the rail moved and expanded and it cracked the plinths. So we had to go back in and fix the plinths. Sometimes also you'll see rail kinks. You'll see this, the, the rail kind of kink a little bit. So they have to do de-stressing of the rail, which is one of the components of the construction of the rail to kind of accommodate that. But you're right, we do have to, the rail itself doesn't have expansion joints, the bridges and things do, but we do have to take that into account as we're building and constructing. By the time it's all done, it should be locked in place. But during construction, you're going to see movement, so you need to make sure that you're not messing stuff up. No, good question. Yes? Oh, boy, that's a good question, and I, I don't know. Um, the majority of money, so, so TriMet is a, is a governmental agency. We don't have any elected officials, but we do um, get our revenue from, um, from public sources. Most of our money comes from state payroll tax. So for our day-to-day -day operations to feed our general fund, most of our money comes from the state payroll tax. We do get about 25% of our revenue from the fare box, so people who ride the, the buses and the trains. And I'm assuming that is going to be the same uh, with the Greenland, I don't know what our daily maintenance costs are. That's a good question. But I could get back to you guys on that if you'd like. Yes? Uh, we have several people who have been tuning in online, okay. watching your streaming video. And they, some of them are enrolled in the class, and I'd like to just ask a couple of sure. questions. Sure, sure. So one question is, you know what, I'm not even Okay, so <laughs> one question is, you mentioned a focus on uh, TODs during station location. East of I-205, the pedestrian environment and bicycle connectivity is lacking, according to this person. Is TriMet doing anything additional to coordinate with Metro and the city to support better pedestrian access and long-term plans for Division as a main street? Uh, for Division Street? Mm -hmm. uh, when we looked at Division Street, we were focusing more on the west side of the freeway because that's the location of our station and within that half-mile, quarter-mile circle that I was talking about. Um, so we did look at, at development opportunities on that side of the freeway, but we didn't really focus as much on the east side because it's outside of our more direct sphere of influence. Okay. But of course, we're open to trying to do the smart thing whenever possible. Okay. Let's see. Anyone else in the room have any other questions? Okay, I'll ask one more. Sure. And be it. Okay, it was mentioned earlier about the different CPTED principles and the safety and natural surveillance and access control principles. The question is um, whether or not this policy of making TriMet stations as safe as possible is only for the I-205 area stations or is it also the case for places such as Expo Center, Delta Park stations? That's a good question. And um, some of the theory behind the SEPTED principles and safety and security is evolving as we evolve um, day to day. You know, as different um, different world events happen that changes how we look at safety and security and what we need to be focusing on. So what we thought met safety and security needs back in the blue line days is different than what happens in today's world. So we always do what we think is the best, smartest thing at the time. Um, now, so some of the features that we have in, in place on the green line, we don't have in place in other lines, but that doesn't mean that that's not our intention. As as resources are available, we are interested in going back and retrofitting our lines, which is what we're doing right now on a lot of the Blue Line stations um, out in Gresham on 82nd Avenue. We're really focusing on how to make some of those, those specific spots, bringing some of these safety and security enhancements, adding better lighting, adding better cameras, making sure we don't have scary spots for bad people to hide. 
that kind of stuff. So we are, as, as it's available, making some of those corrections and modifications. Okay, so we can mm -hmm. expect to see more of that in the future. Yes, um, I'm not personally, I'm, I'm not totally familiar with exactly what we plan on doing at each station, but yeah. Okay. All right, thank you, Megan. Mm -hmm. um, I think we're going to conclude our seminar uh, for today. Um, and I'd like everyone to thank, thank uh, our speaker. A um, couple of things. Next week, we have Professor Chris Monsier from the System Professor in Civil Engineering here. Um, and the topic that he will be speaking on is used archived ITS data to measure the operational benefits of a system-wide adaptive ramp metering system. Swarm. Okay? So that's next week, same time, same place. And um, for those of you who have um, asked questions. I am actually supposed to note on here that you asked a question within the class, and I don't know many of your names. So if you could come up to me real quickly and tell me who you are, that would be great. Thank you. <laughs>